The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace this day from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The journalist Miles Kington once defined the difference between knowledge and wisdom this way. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. I thought about this quote again last week when my seven-year-old Sam was trying to trick his four-year-old sister with the very question, hey, Ellie, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? So that he could, of course, show off his knowledge that a tomato is indeed a fruit, a fact that is utterly perplexing and doubly so to a four-year-old who eats neither tomatoes nor most fruits. In fact, it is a significant development that I learned yesterday that for the first time this last week, she tried ketchup and thought it wasn't disgusting. <laughs> Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, and wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. More broadly speaking, knowledge is having information. Wisdom is knowing what to do with it. For instance, today, I'll bet that most of us have at least some knowledge of those Ten Commandments that we heard in our first reading today. I suspect that at least a few of us had to memorize them in Sunday school or confirmation at some point. And I suspect that for most of us, we know the Ten Commandments primarily as something of a checklist for good behavior. Like, we can get to the end of each day and pull out the list and say, hey, I didn't steal my neighbor's ox, and I didn't even covet it today. I'm doing pretty good here, God. But as it turns out, these Ten Commandments and the other 600 or so laws that are woven into the narrative of God's relationship with God's people, they all actually serve a much deeper purpose than just tracking your behavior. Did you notice how the Ten Commandments begin? It begins with this statement of faith, this statement of who God is. God is the one who has liberated God's people from slavery in Egypt. God is the one guiding them through this wilderness. God is leading them to the promised land. And God has set them apart as his chosen people. This is crucial information to understanding the Ten Commandments and the rest of the laws given to Moses. These commandments are meant to illustrate how you live as people liberated and blessed by God. The commandments are descriptors of the community. The law is meant to expand human imaginations about what it looks like to live in right relationship with God and with others. 
And the heart of the law is found not in merely knowing and keeping each commandment. The heart of the law is found in the way that God intends it to shape God's people to live in the world. The Ten Commandments divide up pretty neatly into two sections. The first four commandments have to do with loving God, and the back ones have to do with loving your neighbor. This is the heart of the law. This is how you live. You love the God who has saved you, and you love your neighbors whom God has also saved. The whole of the law is summed up in love. Not a set of rules, but a rule of life. The law is not about knowledge. It is about wisdom. Fast forward a whole bunch of years, and we get to this church plant at Corinth. This church that Paul planted there had plenty of knowledge. The Corinthians knew the story of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. The Corinthians knew that baptism was a sign of being part of the community of believers. They knew that the way of Christ brought them grace and freedom. But there was still a lot yet to be figured out. They had lots of questions and arguments. Once you're part of the new community of believers, what do you do about all of your old practices? How do you relate to the world around you? Does it matter who baptized you, Paul or another apostle? Who is it that has power in the new community of faith? And how do you settle disputes? And what is your obligation to fellow community members and those in need? And if indeed you're free in Christ, does that mean you're free to do anything you want in this world? Paul tries to address their questions in this first letter to the Corinthians. He tries to counter all of their quarreling by calling them back to very simple truths. That love is the greatest gift, that the cross is the revelation of Christ's love, that the resurrection is the revelation of God's power, and that humility and service are the hallmarks of the life of faith, even if these things appear weak or foolish in the eyes of the world. In his letter, he will say flat out, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge is having information, and wisdom is knowing what to do with it. And the truth is that we can all have knowledge, Paul tells us, and we can speak in the tongues of humans and angels, and we can know all mysteries in heaven and on earth, and we can dutifully give away possessions, and we can tithe our wealth, but if we do not have love, we and the world gain nothing by it. The knowledge that we have about Jesus or scripture, or church history, or systematic theology, or even the church constitution, none of that knowledge matters if it does not lead us to live with love in this world. Because the wisdom of God, which looks like foolishness to the world, is centered in devoted and sacrificial love, shown no more tragically and powerfully than in love that would rather give up its life than give up the cause. And so maybe, maybe this is how we can make some sense of our gospel reading today and what happened there in the temple courtyard. By all counts, there was nothing particularly out of the ordinary happening at the temple that day when Jesus barged in. The ancient temple, by design, was both a place of worship and a center of economic activity for the community. It had currency exchanges and sacrificial animals for purchase, specifically so that even those traveling great distances for festival observances might be able to fully participate in temple and ritual life. There's nothing inherently wrong with this. So... Why does Jesus go all Hulk smash in our gospel today? Why the flipped tables? Why the whip of cords? Maybe, maybe it was to shake things up and to call the people back to basics. 
Maybe it was to disrupt all of the rules and rituals, to remind all those gathered there that their actions, both sacred and profane, are summed up and grounded in love. Maybe it was to remind them that without grounding in love, their sacrifices and their rites and their prayers are just empty displays. Maybe Jesus came storming through in order to call the people back to the holy liberation and love that defines them and should define everything that they do. And maybe beyond that, maybe Jesus wanted to hit pause on everything happening there at the temple so that he might be seen and really seen for who he is as the living, breathing presence of God's love among them. Love that will die but not be defeated by death. Love so powerful that even in its foolishness, it puts to shame the wisdom of the world. A Jesus like that, flipping over tables like that, makes a little bit of sense to me right now. Because maybe one of the lessons and the graces for us in our readings today is this reminder that even when so much has been flipped over around us and so much has been taken from us through this year of pandemic and every extra trial and grief layered on top of it, even in all of it, we can look around the rubble and we can know that the love of God in Christ still stands. This is the one thing that won't fall or fail or be able to be taken away from us. Maybe, maybe when we have nothing else right now, we can be called back to the center of that love. And maybe also today's lessons call us back to the heart of the matter, to that guiding wisdom at the core of our faith, love for God and love for neighbor above all else as we navigate so many transitions right now between pandemic and a building project and pastoral transitions and as we have to keep discerning together what our future will be for this generation and for generations to come and as we navigate both the ordinary and extraordinary quarrels and disagreements and discernments that are simply part of being a community together. Through all of that, when everything else is shifting, we know that we have an unshakable foundation and an unshakable calling. When we don't know what direction to go, where we, when we don't know where the Spirit is leading, we can still ask whether we are loving God and loving our neighbor. And these things will always keep us on track and always assure us that we are moving forward in God's spirit and not apart from it. Throughout 1 Corinthians, Paul hammers home this idea that it is really all about love. Paul will tell us that faith and hope and love will remain. After the dust settles, after the noise dies down, on the far side of whatever the present chaos, there will be faith, and there will be hope, and there will be love. And when we have nothing left of our own striving, when we have exhausted our own strength, when everything else around us has been brought low, there will be faith, and there will be hope, and there will be love. And the greatest of these is love. Love is our strength in weakness. Perfect love casts out all fear. Love, dear ones, is the eternal wisdom that we seek, and it is the eternal wisdom that will sustain us and hold us, and shape us and guide us and transform us, and by God's grace, transform the heart of the world. Knowledge is having information. Wisdom is knowing what to do with it. Go forth into the world, therefore, with all that you know, and do with it what is faithful. Love. Love your God. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Love this good creation. 
This is your eternal wisdom. And it is the heart and the hope of that to which you are called. Amen. <laughs>